Welcome, everyone. Um, I want to welcome you to Arizona State University's Washington Center and the Leadership, Diplomacy, and National Security Lab Speaker Series on Modern Deterrence Strategy. Uh, I am David Sheffer, Professor of Practice at ASU, and with General Ben Freakley, also Professor of Practice, head up the National Security Programming for the LDNS Lab. And we're very pleased also to have our colleagues, Professors of Practice and Ambassadors, uh, Mike Polt and Ben Freakley, and I mean, Ben is already here as a general, and Rod Moore uh, joining us uh, today. Our aim in this series is to demonstrate the numerous layers of deterrence, meaning not only of military character, but also focusing on economics, diplomacy, law, intelligence, the cyberspace, culture, education, and the national will of our citizens. So far, we've had speakers focusing on corporate foreign policy, lawfare, and cyber defense. Today, we focus on the national will and more, and are extremely pleased to welcome our colleague on the ASU faculty, Peter Bergen, whom everyone has at least watched and learned for years on CNN as one of its top experts and its top national security expert. But let me elaborate a bit more about Peter Bergen. He is an author, documentary producer, podcast host, professor of practice at Arizona State University, Vice President of uh, New America here in Washington, and CNN's National Security Analyst. He has written or edited 10 books about terrorism and national security issues, three of which were New York Times bestsellers. They have been translated into 24 languages. He has testified before US congressional committees 18 times about national security issues, and has held positions teaching graduate students about those issues at Harvard and Johns Hopkins University. Bergen has produced multiple documentaries for CNN, HBO, Discovery, National Geographic, and Showtime. He has been nominated for four Emmys, and an HBO film based on one of his books won the Emmy for Best Documentary. He hosts the Audible podcast In the Room with Peter Bergen, for which I had the distinct honor of being the first episode's interviewee. The podcast has been a roaring success, and I highly recommend it to all of you. Peter is uh, the board chair of the Global Special Operations Foundation, Homeland Security Experts Group member, and a fellow at Fordham University's Center for National Security. He has a degree in modern history from Oxford. Peter today will speak about deterring America's rivals and enemies. I'll have a brief colloquy with him at the close of his remarks, and then we will open it up for audience questions, and we'll close right at 1 a.m. Yeah. Oh, that's a long <laughs> Did someone say le more than that? Oh, I'm sorry, 1 p.m., yes. <laughs> 1, 1 p.m., yes, absolutely. <laughs> Uh, for those many individuals joining, you can see the world I live in. Yeah. <laughs> for those many individuals joining us virtually, including our ASU students and faculty, uh, please uh, type in your questions in the chat box with your name. And then my colleague, Ashley Wright, who makes all of this happen, will convey those questions in writing to me to ask Peter. So for the virtual audience, and we have a large virtual audience, please feel free to lodge questions. Uh, through the chat box. Peter Bergen, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ambassador Sheffer, and thank you also, General Freakley, uh, for the invitation to speak today. There is such a thing in Washington as a free lunch, you're consuming it. Um, and uh, this, when uh, Ambassador Sheffer asked me to uh, speak about this issue, I realized I actually needed to do a fair amount of homework because it's not necessarily my area of expertise. And so we're at an interesting moment in American history. We have the largest land war in Europe since World War II. Uh, she has basically appointed himself for an unprecedented third term. So he's the strongest Chinese president since Mao. Uh, we have the possibility of the invasion of, Kuwait, uh, of Taiwan. 
Uh, we have the possibility of a Trump presidency and perhaps pulling out of NATO, or at least if not pulling out of NATO, um, <clears throat> making it much less effective. Because even if Congress, there is legislation in Congress to prevent the US being pulled out of NATO, but if the commander in chief of the US military says, we're not coming to the defense of Estonia, and I'm going to ignore Article 5, it, that doesn't really matter. So uh, we also have the large, the largest election in human history in India right now, which may elect Modi to a third term. He is likely to take that as an endorsement of a Hindu first Indian state and a more assertive Indian foreign policy that resulting from that. Uh, so you know, it, it's an interesting moment to talk about deterrence. Um, and as I was thinking about deterrence, um, it's not a subject that I never studied formally, it, there seems to be, be a fairly obvious kind of uh, definition in a sense, which is obviously it's about the, mili the military hardware you have and also your willingness to use it, which are two very different questions. And in a democracy like the United States, you need the Congress to authorize a war, you need the president to, to execute, uh, he or she can take authorizations provided by Congress, for instance, the authorization for the use of military force after 9-11 to do a lot of unexpected things with it. Uh, it. I don't think it was predictable several days after 9-11. Uh, there was only one person who voted against it, Barbara Lee, for the authorization of, for the use of military force. I don't think it was predictable that that authorization would be used for military operations in many, many, many countries. And in fact, the United States went to war in various forms in seven countries and continues today, by the way, in Somalia to con conduct operations that result from that authorization for the use of military force. And then also, of course, beyond the Congress and president, you also need popular will. But on the question of popular will uh, and popular support for the war, America's enemies have tended to, they often mistake our raucous politics for weakness. And so um, when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor in 1941, they did it to preemptively prevent the United States, in their view, allowing them to conquer Asia. And they also probably took comfort from the fact that there were a lot of isolationists in Congress, and they thought the United States would do nothing. Well, that didn't turn out very well. And the United States then spent 40% of its GDP on World War II and put 16, men and men and 16 million men and women in uniform to win the war. So it is a fairly common mistake of America's enemies to think that uh, we're weak because it seems that we are we have a chaotic political uh but you know we saw just recently with the house uh speaker johnson doing something you know i think uh, pretty uh unusual which was getting the 60 billion dollars of ukraine aid along with the israel aid along with the taiwan aid through the through the house and i think that was perhaps surprising to vladimir putin in fact i saw on twitter i, I don't know apparently Putin was rushing to the office late late on the night that <laughs> Ukraine aid was being was the the, the Ukraine vote was happening. Uh, you know, not clear if that it was a reaction to that, but clearly his calculation that he could basically wait uh, wait the Ukrainians out to the twenty twenty four election, hope that Trump wins, hope that Trump is sincere about sort of uh, undermining NATO at the very least. Uh, that hope may have now disappeared because you know potentially Biden can win the election. And, Zelensky probably has another year of runway with $60 billion worth of aid. Another enemy of the United States who kind of confused, uh, basically assumed that we, the United States was a paper tiger was Osama bin Laden. Now, uh, we interviewed bin Laden in 97, and he said versions of the United States is a paper tiger. You're as weak as the former Soviet Union. He based that view on our pullout from Lebanon in 1983. Ronald Reagan, you recall, after the Marine barracks attack that killed 241 American service members pulled the United States out of Lebanon. Ten years later, uh, Bill Clinton pulled the United States out of Somalia after the Black Hawk Down incident. Well, bin Laden in 1983 was uh, 21, um, and in uh, you know, so he was he was a young an, an adult, and he concluded from the 1983 pullout that if you apply sufficient military pressure on the United States, they will pull out of the Middle East. And that was his analysis. Of course, it was a very uh, misguided analysis because when they, when, when Al Qaeda attacked on 9-11, uh, the United States reacted uh, in a way that 
produced exactly the opposite outcome of what bin Laden wanted. The United States got more involved in the Middle East than at any time in its history, fighting wars of various kinds in Afghanistan, Iraq, Yemen, Somalia, Libya, Syria, uh, all wars that in one way or another originated from the 9-11 attack. Uh, so one, I think, overall point to make is the United States, the enemies and rivals of the United States often underestimate American resolve, which isn't to say that we haven't made plenty of mistakes, um, some of which I'll uh, get into in a minute. Um, so, and actually one other quick point here. Uh, I was reading, there's a good book by Petraeus and uh, Lord Andrew Roberts called Conflict, and they make the good point that when you do a surprise attack, you almost guarantee that you, the person you're surprising is going to react in a very, very, very unfavorable way. And if you think about the surprise attacks of Pearl Harbor and 9-11, they produce a very, very strong response from the United States in the same way that the October 7th Hamas attack on Israel also produced a very strong response. So if you're going to do a surprise attack, uh, be careful for what you wish for. And, and, and one related point is, you know, relates to the question of deterring states or non-states. Obviously, a group like Al-Qaeda is not a state and doesn't have a return address. It took, five, it took a decade to find bin Laden after 9-11, not for a lack of trying, um, because Al-Qaeda doesn't have a geographical you know, sort of return to sender address that you can respond to. Um, that is not the case, obviously, for Iran, which has nuclear plants, uh, headquarters, or any other state. Uh, so deterring a group like Al-Qaeda actually turns out to be pretty difficult. On the other hand, uh, you know, the amount of, obviously, Al-Qaeda killed 3,000 Americans on 9-11, which is not insignificant, but it is not a nuclear catastrophe or something like that, if we ever were to come to that point with a state like China or Russia. So what is deterrence? The idea has been around for a long time, and there's a Latin phrase, si vis pacem parum, si vis pacem parabellum, which means if you want peace, prepare for war. And uh, I think that's a pretty good definition of deterrence. Uh, people have to assume that you're going to uh, not only use the, the military you have, um, but also have a sub substantial military. And during the Cold War, deterrence was you know, achieved through a variety of purposes. One, of course, was mutually, assur mutually assured destruction. Uh, and of course, there were close calls like the, the Cuban Missile Crisis, where we almost had uh, a, a nuclear exchange with the, with the Soviets. And then through the doctrine of containment, uh, you know, we basically prevented the spread of communism, whether it was the Vietnam War, which didn't obviously end as satisfactory for the United States, or the Afghan War, which did end satisfactory for the United States. The Afghan War against the Soviets in the 1980s was supported by $3 billion of U.S. aid. That aid was matched by the, the Saudis. Uh, at first, and this is a very interesting point about the Afghan War, I think, at first, all the United States wanted to do to the Russians in Afghanistan was to basically hand them a Vietnam or hand them a bloody nose. But the, Reagan and others around him by 1986 had decided not only to inflict, you know, send a lot of body bags back to Russia, but actually to win the war. And that was, very, that was new thinking because just like today with Biden and Ukraine, there is this kind of concern that if we, you know, there's gonna be a certain point that we can't cross before we get into an actual confrontation with at that time, the Soviets and now the Russians. And so for a long time, until 1986, the US policy in Afghanistan was to arm the resistance, but not in a way where they could win. In 1986, that changed with the introduction of the Stinger anti-aircraft missile into the, uh, into the theater. By then, the Russians had already begun to start thinking about leaving. Uh, but the Stinger missile was crucial because it ended Russian uh, air superiority in, in Afghanistan, basically, at the time, the most sophisticated anti-aircraft missile in existence. Um, and hitherto, the Soviets had enjoyed total air superiority. So introducing the, 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 uh, the Stinger missile and no American boots on the ground, uh, the Soviets withdrew, withdrew in February of 89. And um, I don't think it's a coincidence that when, within a few months, the Berlin Wall fell. Why do I say that? Because... Um, if you think about a lightly armed guerrilla force on your own border that you can't defeat, which is a case, think about the, the Soviet Union at that time, Afghanistan was a bordering country. 
they couldn't defeat a lightly armed guerrilla force on their own border. What did that mean for the people in Eastern Europe? It meant that the Soviets were not probably capable or, or, or intent on violently putting down any kind of un unrest in Eastern Europe. Uh, and I think that the Afghan war was the, you know, a very big nail in the Soviet coffin. Uh, so an example of, you know, getting our strategic goals uh, with really very little cost to the United States itself in terms of boots on the ground. Um, so during the Cold War, there was considerable political agreement about the need to uh, you know, oppose the Soviets, deter the Soviets. Uh, I was kind of interested to learn that we were spending an average of 7% of GDP on our defense spending during almost throughout the Cold War. Today, we're spending 3% under, under President Joe Biden. That's still $850 billion. And it's still more than nine times the other countries uh, that are sort of in positions two through 10, which include China, Russia, India, Saudi Arabia, United Kingdom, Germany, France, South Korea, Japan, and Ukraine. So it's quite a, <laughs> quite a significant am amount of military spending, which presumably has a deterrent effect in all of itself. You can make a caveat this, about this, say the Chinese are probably not being completely uh, transparent about their actual military expenditures. And of course, when you're paying a Chinese soldier, they're getting paid like $109 a month, which is not what a US soldier is getting paid. But nonetheless, the, the broader point is we're spending plenty of money on our military. Um, and our military is obviously not our only strength. Uh, you know, Jim Mattis, the former Secretary of Defense, has called, I think rightly, NATO the most successful military alliance in modern history. I think that's true. And that alliance is growing because of Putin. I mean, uh, we now have Finland and Sweden. And very interestingly, Putin has done the thing that Trump and even Obama before him wanted very much, which is every country in, in NATO to spend 2% at least of its GDP on defense spending. And that is beginning to happen. Even Germany, which of course was very, you know, has been very reluctant to spend money on its defense, is now says that it's going to be spending 2% this year of GDP on its defense. So you have NATO, and then you also have the five eyes, which are of course the the, the intelligence sharing between the United Kingdom, the US, Australia, New Zealand, and Canada. And then finally, you also have other tools, not just diplomacy, uh, but you also have the ability to conduct cyber attacks. So we have a pretty formidable set of tools at our disposal, we the United States. So fast forward to the end of the Cold War, and there was a great deal of triumphalism about kind of our place. Uh, you know, uh, Frank Fukuyama famously declared the end of history. I didn't mean that history had ended, but basically that history had a sort of purpose and direction, which was essentially towards liberal democracies. By the way, I'm, 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 I'm by, I, I studied history, and I, have, I completely do not share this view that history has a purpose and a direction. I just don't. I think it's a very common view. It's very, it's very common in the United States because we too have this sort of city on the hill view. That, but I, I think you know, in general, I think it underestimates the ability for humans to do evil make mistakes. <laughs> um, but so there was this triumphalism at the end of the Cold War that we had won it and that history was going in our direction. Now we have a bunch of illiberal democracies around the world. Uh, in fact, you know, there's a sort of democratic, uh, uh, you know, we, we're seeing not, 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 not only around the world, but even in our own country, democratic backsliding. So the idea that history had a direction uh, was uh, one of the sort of, I think, mistakes that we made after the Cold War. Uh, obviously, we won it against the Soviets, but it doesn't, didn't mean that you know, peace and harmony was going to break out. Um, and then there was a related view to Fukuyama, which was Thomas Friedman's view that he, he called it the golden arches theory of sort of um, uh, conflict. And basically, he said, look, if, if, if a country has a McDonald's and another country has a McDonald's, they won't go to war against each other. Well, that turned out to be totally total nonsense. Um, one of the first uh, Russian missile strikes hit a U Ukrainian McDonald's, uh, and McDonald's is pulled out of Ukraine. Uh, McDonald's is pulled out of Russia. Uh, so the idea, you know, basically this idea that it, as we get more prosperous, everybody's going to be kind of nicer to each other and better. And this was a very kind of common view, and this was our view not only of Russia but also of China, which is that uh, you know as China liberalizes economically is also going to liberalize politically. Well, actually, the completely opposite happened, which is China is far more repressive today as it is now the second largest economy in the world. So they've imprisoned 2 million Uyghurs and other ethnic minorities. They extinguished uh, an independent democratic state effectively in Hong Kong. 
Uh, <clears throat> they imposed course zero COVID, uh, which was you know unpopular, but they were able to do it. Um, they have uh, created the world's most effective surveillance state. I learned from a guy called Josh Chin recently, um, who's written a very good book called Surveillance State about China, that the Chinese have cameras that can recognize your gait. So even if you're you know, even if your face is covered, they can recognize who, who you are simply by your gait. Um, so this is the world's most effective surveillance state. So the whole theory that as they prospered, they would become more liberal turned out to be wrong. And so here we are um, with both, you know, in an era of great power competition, uh, General Freakley served, in, you know, in fact, I embedded with the 10th Mountain Division when General Freakley was, uh, its commander, commanding general, uh, back in 1996, and uh, sorry, in 2006 in, in Urish Khan. You know, I I think that in in Washington today, there's this idea that you know it's an era of great power competition. That's not wrong. I sort of you know October 7th, I think, and the attack in Moscow shows that you know uh, there are other forms of conflict that are going to continue. But th thinking about the great powers that we are in competition with. Um, let's start with Russia, and then I'll, I'll get to China in a minute, and maybe a bit of Iran. So on Russia, the Munich Security Conference is sort of, uh, you know, Senator McCain was always there. Uh, it, is a meet, it, it is the annual meeting of the world's leaders. It's kind of a celebration of the you know, NATO alliance. Uh, and Putin came, and he gave a speech, which was, like, very unexpected. <laughs> and basically, he said... Um, he talked about the almost uncontained hyper use of force in international relations that the United States was dominating global relations. And he, he said, none of this makes us feel safe. And it, instead of sort of going along with the idea, because it, it's hard to remember this at that time, there were even discussions about Russians maybe coming into NATO. There were, you know, there was a, a very different kind of uh, feeling around Russia at the time. So Putin comes in, he gives a speech and the speech didn't get enough attention really. Uh, because the speech basically laid the intellectual groundwork for a lot of things that flow from it, which in 2008, Putin invaded Georgia. Uh, during the George W. Bush administration, the US response was to do absolutely nothing. Uh, Putin's intent was to prevent Georgia from joining NATO, one, keeping it inside the Russian sphere of influence. So George W. Bush administration did essentially nothing. Fast forward to 2014, you know, uh, Hillary Clinton had wanted to do a reset with Russia. Uh, Putin uh, takes Crimea, parts of eastern Ukraine. There's a bunch of sanctions. Uh, sanctions, uh, I think, are a few good measures that never really have the policy outcomes uh, that people want, very rarely. Um, and essentially, the United States did nothing in 2014. And, you know, Putin must have felt that in 2022, um, you know, the United States and its allies would likely do very little when he, when he invaded. That, of course, turned out to be a a total mistake. Um, but he had reason to think, I, I was talking about this with General Freakley just before we we began the session. You know, the US withdrawal from Afghanistan in August of 2021, to me, it's not an accident that within several months, the, Putin moved 70,000 troops to the Ukrainian border. Uh, he obviously had always intended to carry out this attack. But he must have felt the timing is really right. Biden is pulling back from the world. Uh, he's pulling out of Afghanistan. That's the mood both on the left of the Democratic Party and the right of the Republican Party. And this is as good a time as ever to do this. Uh, so I think the Afghan withdrawal signaled, and we're talking about deterrence, a, a lack of, <laughs> uh, you know, was uh, something that uh, it, it was an unforced error of the first order, in my view. I mean, we had 2,500 troops in Afghanistan on August the 15th, 2021. Um, and uh, those troops those troops were enough to prevent the United uh, the, 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 the Taliban from taking any of the 34 provincial cities in Afghanistan. And once those troops started drawing down, the Taliban took all those cities. And if you think about the 20 year war that we were in, the Taliban only were able to take a provincial city one or two of them for maybe five days. They could never hold. They could never hold any any city uh, for any length of time. And you know we have twenty five hundred. We have a, over twenty thousand American troops in in South Korea right now. 
We've had them there since the end of hostilities in 1953. And they are, you know, they are keeping the peace. And I, I think that you know, the Afghan, if you, President Biden came out and said something I think, which I think was wrong on so many levels, which is, he said versions of the following. One, you know, you know, Afghanistan sort of like, you know, we've got bigger fish to fry, the Chinese, the Russians, and, you know, well, Bagram Air Base is probably one of the biggest air bases in the world, uh, one of the most busiest air bases in the world. It happens to be right next to China, which has an Afghan border, right next to Iran, which has an Afghan border, and right next to the former Soviet republics like Tajikistan, which also have an Afghan border. And we just gave that up for no reason at all. Uh, so anyway, it was a unforced error of the first order. Uh, I think if you were thinking about deterrence, this was, you know, actually encouraged our, our rivals uh, because it, it sort of it appeared that we were weak. Um, so I mentioned sanctions earlier. I just want to have a quick thing about that because sanctions are part of a kind of U.S. policy response to our rivals. I think it's a very weak response. It's a feel-good measure. It's sort of like, you know, the policy advisor comes in and says, you have three, we have, you know, Mr. President or Mrs. President, we have, you know, three options here, nuclear war, uh, sanctions, or do nothing and get criticized. <laughs> right. By the public for doing nothing. Sanctions, you know, can, I, you know, there, there are so few examples of sanctions producing the policy outcomes the United States wants. There, are, there's an academic debate about the extent to which sanctions on South Africa did help end apartheid, and that may well be an example of where they work. There is no doubt that very effective sanctions on particularly getting Iran excluded from the SWIFT system, which is basically means that you can no longer be involved in any international banking, helped get Iran to the negotiating table for the nuclear deal in 2015 with the Obama administration. But those are the only examples. And we've had shanks. And, sorry, I was kind of in, it was just the other day, you know, the Biden administration said, Biden administration said we're going to put more sanctions on Iran. I'm like, what else can we sanction? I mean, <laughs> that's been going on for like so many different presidents. Do you think Kim Il-jung worries if we sanction some other thing? Do you think, I mean, so these sanctions, I, I think, generally speaking, as a sort of tool, they 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 don't achieve their policy at, at goals. It may be great that some Russian billionaire can't go to holiday in the south of France, but it doesn't really change Putin's calculus. So after all, he has a billion dollar uh, dacha in 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 near Sochi that he can go to. He's not going to take a vacation in the south of France anytime soon. So so on on the Ukrainian twenty twenty two invasion. I do think the Afghan war was part of Putin's calculus. Obviously, it backfired tremendously, at least initially. Uh, it was designed to keep Ukraine out of NATO, which got two, which now has two two more members. There's more NATO spending. Um, but Stalin famously observed that quantity has a quality of its own, and the fact is, the Russian population is three times the size, at least, of the Ukrainian population. We, you know, they they just reduced the. I was astonished to find out that the average age of the Ukrainian soldier is 40. Um, and, you know, Zelensky has faced a lot of popular uh, opposition to dropping the uh, the draft age from 27 to 25, which he's just done. I mean, he, they need manpower. Obviously, they need, you know, all the things, the missiles, the, the high miles missiles and other things that the $60 billion in aid can provide. But at the end of the day, they have a, they have a manpower problem compared to the, to the Russians. So... How this will end, um, you know, wars end usually in two ways. One is defeat and capitulation, um, which happened obviously with the Japanese in the United States, or a, a mutual recognition of a mutually hurting stalemate. And that's basically both sides realize no one's going to win here. And they come to the negotiating table and they make some kind of deal which satisfies no one. Uh, but that's what deals are. And, you know, the interesting question is, what are Putin's red lines in this deal? What are Zelensky's? Putin's, I think, is Crimea. And Zelensky probably wants to get as much back of eastern Ukraine as, as he can get from the 2014 incursion uh, by, by the Russians. Uh, but that's going to be a long time coming. The best we can probably hope for is some kind of armistice, the same kind of thing that ended the Korean War, which is not a peace, but kind of a, uh, a, a cessation of hostilities. Which brings me to an interesting point about nuclear weapons as a deterrent. Guess which country is one of the few countries in the world to give up nuclear weapons? Ukraine. Ukraine gave up its nuclear weapons. And if you do the thought experiment where it hadn't, 
at one point, Ukraine was the third largest nuclear power in the world in terms of nuclear, the numbers of nuclear weapons it had. And so one of the lessons, and it's not a, not a very uh, salubrious one potentially, is that you give up nuclear weapons, you're basically making yourself a target. And if you look at the history of India and Pakistan, India and Pakistan have fought three major wars since partition in 1947. Now they have both sides have nuclear weapons. They have not had a major war, which doesn't mean, doesn't mean miscalculations can't happen. doesn't mean mistakes can't happen. And I think India and Pakistan probably have rather immature nuclear doctrines, similar to what the Soviets and the Russians had, Soviets and Americans had in the 1950s. Uh, so, you know, the, where is the most likely place to have a nuclear war? It would be between Pakistan and India at, right now. However, they are, you know, it is a deterrent to major war, no doubt, uh, which isn't to say, of course, mistakes can happen. And um, we, there's a, there's a mistake that I, I think is rather, uh, or, or, or a near miss that is quite famous, uh, which uh, Lieutenant Colonel in the Soviet Air Defense Forces in 1983 saw what, he, what looked like an incoming US nuclear launch. He, in a, in a culture which doesn't encourage this kind of decision-making, <laughs> decided that this was a mistake and that he was not going to, he wasn't like awarded like some star for preventing World War III. Uh, but he, in 1983, decided this was a false alarm. We only found out about this uh, in uh, many years later when the Soviet Union kind of opened up and the archives became open. So, of course, there's always the possibility of mistakes. But and when we're talking about deterrence, obviously, nuclear weapons are a significant deterrent. Which brings me to Taiwan and China more generally. So uh, Bill Clinton went to Beijing University, basically said the Internet's going to change everything. It's going to open China up. Going to be great. Um, you know, I've seen freedom in many mass manifestations in China. I've seen the cell phones, the video players, the fax machines carrying ideas, information, and images from all over the world. Well, as you know, it didn't, that vision of China didn't happen. And the China today uh, obviously is very different from the Soviet Union in the sense that it's the second largest economy in the world. The Soviet Union had a, basically sold nothing to the United States except maybe vodka and caviar. Um, whereas China is our third largest trading partner after Mexico and Canada, is the second largest com economy in the world, we're very integrated. So a war between these two powers is, you know, would seem on the face of it less likely. Although, you know, global trade is, as a percentage of, uh, uh, I, I, I think before the First World War, global trade was at an all-time high. So the idea, again, that trade is sort of going to create peace that isn't, 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 isn't necessarily the case. That said, um, we, you know, a war with a war with the second world's second largest economy uh, and our third largest trading partner, you know, hopefully won't happen. Uh, but we are in a very different strategic posture towards China than we were, uh, you know, when Bill Clinton made those remarks at, Bill, at Beijing University. There are many differences between the Trump and Biden administration, but one thing they agree on is China is, the, you know, essentially the main threat we face. And when you look at the 2017 National Security Strategy, which was written by H.R. McMaster and Nadia Shadlow, uh, it's very clear about a variety of things that we now take for, pretty much for granted about China. They're stealing hundreds of billions of millions of dollars of our intellectual property. Uh, they've got the fastest growing military in the world. Uh, they want to turn the South China Sea into a Chinese lake, and they're succeeding, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the Biden administration has actually kept the, many of the Trump tariffs in place on China. And has actually, I think, had an even more aggressive posture on China because if you think about uh, the fact that Biden has banned the sale of any AI, uh, American AI uh, to China, American quantum, quantum computing, uh, there is a recognition that you know China there's certainly no reason to help our main rival by giving them this technology, and. The, uh, I think the Biden administration has got a version of containment with China now that it's obviously not exactly the same that we have with the Soviets, but it go, the, the, the most important uh, single thing that anybody produces in the world are highly, uh, very powerful semiconductor chips. Now, unfortunately, 98% of those chips are made in Taiwan, which happens to be 100 miles off the coast of China, and China has made it very clear that it wants to invade Taiwan. <laughs> In which case, you know, don't throw away your iPhone because, you know, um, you know, you're not, you're not going to get a repair, <laughs> a replacement anytime soon if they if they were to invade Taiwan. So this turns out to be a huge strategic problem and error, 
that Taiwan is the center of chip production, not all chip production, but of the high-end chip production in the world. Taiwan Semiconductor is the world, I don't know, so I think it's 96 or 98 percent of, of the really high-end chips. So fast forward to Gina Raimondo, who's a Commerce Secretary in the Chips Act, which is $52 billion uh, to spend on chips in the United States. And Arizona is uh, one of the beneficiaries of that, because uh, just I think it was last week, $6 billion was uh, earmarked for a plant in Arizona. Building these chips is fantastically expensive. And I just found out from this very good book by David Sanger that just came out called The New Cold Wars. I just found out about a company in the Netherlands called ASML. ASML produces, is the only company in the world that produces etching equipment for nano-sized chips. And so the prime minister of the, of the Netherlands came to Washington. Biden said, basically, on no account send any, sell any of these the $150 million machines to China. Uh, and the Dutch prime minister agreed he's probably going to be the next leader of NATO. Uh, and so the Biden administration is trying to ensure that China doesn't eat America's lunch by by you know, moving the money, of these chips uh, back into the United States. And this is not I mean, there's a decoupling from China. That's not really going to be possible. But there's a de-risking our kind of exposure to China is something that that we can do and, and, and should do. Um, I I don't I I realize I I probably uh, could go on for much much longer, <laughs> but I don't want to stay up till one a.m. with all of you here. Uh, so and I do want to leave room for questions. So, um, so in in, in closing, um, I didn't really get to to Iran. Um, I will, you know, Henry Kissinger said a very interesting thing about Iran, which is Iran has to decide if it's a cause or a nation. Uh, he, he wrote this in 2006. And of course, I think they, they pretty much decided they're a cause. Um, and if you look at, from, look at it from Tehran's perspective, first of all, Hezbollah in the 80s, you know, Hezbollah essentially controls Lebanon politically and militarily. The Leb Lebanese military is very weak. Hezbollah is pretty strong. Fast forward to 2003, kind of the original sin in the Middle East, our invasion of Iraq produces a sole winner, according to the official U.S. Army history of the Iraq war. The sole winner of the war was Iran. Then you have the 2011 civil war in Syria. Iran comes in, basically says Bashar al-Assad is the most powerful uh, country uh, in, in, in Syria. And then fast forward to 2015, when the Saudis get involved in the Yemeni civil war, uh, Iran really starts arming the Houthis. The Houthis, you can't build an anti-ship ballistic missile in your basement in Yemen. You're getting it supplied by the Iranians. So from the Iranian perspective, I think things are going pretty well. That said, you know, we, without rehearsing all the things we now that happened in the last month, I think, strangely, the parents between all these different players seems to have been restored, just maybe for a bit. <laughs> because... Yeah, Iran did something unprecedented with 350 missile strikes and drone strikes against Israel. Israel responded in a fairly measured response, but showed, demonstrated to the Iranians that we can attack something you hold very dear, which is your nuclear facilities, because they struck near one of them, uh, but also do it in a way without even entering your airspace. And so for the moment, it seems that, um, yeah, there, there seems to be kind of a little bit of a collective uh, sort of pause in the Middle East. Where, where all sides feel like deterrence has been restored. You know, will it hold? Who the hell knows? Um, and so on that note, I'll finish. Thanks. Peter, come on over and have a... Okay. Oh, actually, no, not... Yeah, come on over and have a seat. Okay. Yeah. Let's sit you down. I feel like I'm being summoned to yeah. the headmaster's office. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Uh, first, I'm going to ask a few questions of you, and then we'll yeah. open it up to uh, the audience. I want to uh, take off from something that you said that is powerful, and that is you you spent some time on our withdrawal from Afghanistan in August of 2021, and how that sent a powerful signal to Putin, yeah. which quickly thereafter we saw Russian troops moving towards the Ukrainian uh, border. How do we avoid sending those signals henceforth? In other words, 
does one logically just uh, look to you know the bill that just is being adopted, I think, today in, in the Senate on Ukraine, Taiwan, Israel, Gaza, uh, not sending the wrong signal, but sending the right signal, that bill, uh, the, or collection of bills. But also, how do we send non-military signals of strength? You mentioned, you talked about sanctions not really being the magic bullet. Um, should we be focusing in our non-military signals on demonstrating a very strong cyber defense, um, a strong, and may I say, a strong statement occasionally on human rights? I mean, we know that Modi is moving towards the Hindu nationalist agenda in India. Yeah. And in fact, what he said yesterday or the day before, which has been all over the news, about uh, the Muslims is is a cause of concern, and we, I'm sure, are calculating what is the right signal to uh, deter not India as any kind of military threat, obviously, but rather India as a free democratic society recognizing fundamental freedoms and rights. It's a big question, but <laughs> I, can you just focus on what would be the right signals right now? Well, I'm going to quote uh, Kareem Sajipur, an expert on Iran. <laughs> he said, you know, basically, when we're talking about deterring Iran, on the right, it's like we just need to be stronger and tougher. And on the left, it's just like we just need to be nicer. And neither of those really, kind of, neither of those have really kind of got the results we wanted. And so what he was saying is the Soviet era containment uh, of Iran, particularly with a focus on human rights. I mean, back in the Back in the 70s and 80s, you know, Russian uh, dissidents were household names in the United States, right? But Iranian dissidents are not. So he was saying, you know, we should learn some lessons from that and uh, speak speak up more clearly. I mean, obviously, there's a dilemma here because in, Obama faced this dilemma in 2009, which is if he supported the protests, then the Ayatollahs would just say, well, it's an American protest mm. for America. But, so, I mean, I'm not saying anything, any of this is, is, is easy, but on the point, on the question of Iran, Karim Sajipur, who, you know, he's an Iranian expert, was saying we should do more to, to support the dissidents in Iran, because obviously the regime is very unpopular, uh, relatively speaking. I mean, you know, they, they control the guns, but they don't, you know, the population is, is not really on their side. On the question of um, cyber, obviously, you know, we put back the Iranian nuclear program very dramatically through Stuxnet. And so, I mean, that it costs us nothing, right? I mean, really, <laughs> I think Stuxnet, the, the, the virus kind of got out a little bit and probably interfered with them. But nonetheless, it was pretty successful, probably knocked that program back a lot. So, you know, we have great cyber capabilities and we should use them when it's appropriate. Um, and on, on Modi, you know, if if he turns India into a kind of Hindu first state, which I think is what he wants to do, you know, that does have some national security implications. You know, does it make it more likely that there would be a war with Pakistan? Um, it, it, you know, Modi, uh, so, so we'll, we'll see. Another one, if you look back 30 years to the immediate post-Cold War period, and you've described some of our instruments of deterrence then, how would you describe the landscape today on deterrence 30 years later? In other words, what would distinguish those heady days after the Cold War ended and what we thought was necessary for deterrence to today? And it's a kind of an obvious question given the, the risk that is posed by China and Russia in particular to the United States today. But are there different tools of deterrence today that you would emphasize 30 years later? Well, I think you mentioned one, which is cyber. I mean, we didn't have that ability. Um, and widespread, uh, yeah. So, I mean, I, I think that that is certainly, certainly different. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk about American decline. And I, I looked at, you know, I think as a percentage of work, global GDP, we're still at like 24%. When it, you know, so it's... I, I I imagine our rivals. Uh, Jim Mattis was asked the classic question, "What keeps you up at night?" at one of one of these Sunday shows when he was Secretary of Defense, and he said, 
actually my job is to keep other people up at night. So you know, I think he knew the question was coming and he had the line rehearsed. But I, you know, I, I think it's easy for us to sort of, in a sense, sort of uh, be more concerned about our, our weaknesses than, than perhaps we, if we look at it from our rivals' perspectives, uh, you know, Putin got a very unpleasant surprise with Biden's reaction to the February 24th invasion of Ukraine. I'm sure he was, I'm sure he believed that Biden was going to do very little based on the fact that Bush had done very little, Obama had done very little, mm -hmm. and the pullout from Afghanistan. So I think our deterrent abilities remain quite high. Um, I'm not an expert on nuclear deterrence. Obviously, the Chinese are building up their nuclear capabilities pretty rapidly. At the end of the day, you know, we didn't, Taiwan is, you know, kind of the flashpoint that we have to be concerned about. She has said that the People's Liberation Army needs to be able to take Taiwan by 2027. We've had a four-star American uh, general uh, running Transcom saying he expects the conflict to begin in 2025 and he would be responsible for transporting material to to the war zones. Mm -hmm. So either way, you know, it's possible. And she, of course, you know, he's an old, getting older and he's he may want to do some sort of legacy building effort and bring Taiwan in. What would happen, you know, how do you deter him would most Americans sort of get on board for a war that would lead to the hundreds and you know, very large scale American casualties remains to be determined. I think one of the lessons that she must have taken from Taiwan is things can go uh, from Ukraine is things can go wrong. And the hardest military thing you can do is, uh, you know, kind of a is a waterborne invasion. Uh, that is a very tough military maneuver. So, you know, I think the common view is now that they might try and sort of slowly strangle Taiwan over time um, and by, you know, through a blockade. Um, you know, what can we do to dissuade Xi from that? One thing is we can turn Taiwan into the into a porcupine, which is, you know, arming it in such a way that it makes it a very, very tough bite to swallow. Um, and, but, you know, if I was a betting man, I don't think that, yeah, you know, it depends who's president, obviously, to some degree, but there would obviously be a pretty healthy debate in the United States. Do we really want to go to war over Taiwan? As you know, Ambassador Sheffer, our policy has been strategic ambiguity, which is a fancy way of saying, we're not going to tell you what we're going to do. Well, Biden has changed that in his interview with 60 Minutes in 2022. He made it very clear. There's no strategic ambiguity. If China attacks Taiwan, we will respond, uh, which is an interesting... <laughs> development. Um, but how would the American public feel about that? You know, putting American boots on the ground for Taiwan? I don't know. Can I ask you this question? Do you yeah. think authoritarian uh, governments, whether it be Russia, China, Iran, North Korea, etc., are underestimating the current national will of the American people? I ask this question because you raised the 1941 Japanese example that they clearly underestimated America in attacking Pearl Harbor in terms of the strength of our response. Yeah. Or at least we think they really underestimated it. How do you feel about today? Is there an underestimation? Is there the same kind of um, time lag that one might expect if we're hit hard, then it will take some time, but we, we establish the resolve to respond? Another lesson she may have taken from Ukraine is <clears throat> look how long it took our act to get our act together, the United States and its allies to do anything about the Ukrainian invasion. Mm. <laughs> and that's because we are a democracy and you know, we, we deliberate. And so our response time, and you know, we kept being worried about red lines that maybe we may be crossing with Putin. So I think, look, if I was she and I'm looking at the American response, response to Ukraine, I would be saying, look, if we can get inside the US decision cycle to make any kind of decision, i.e. just take Taiwan in a matter of days, you know, basically it's a fait accompli and it's done. So I don't think that's underestimating us or overestimating us. I think that's just a good assessment of kind of just the way our system right. works, which is it doesn't, <laughs> it works slowly. Uh, but it also, you know, ultimately, you know, we, we, yeah, Biden, I think, has did an overall very good job on on, on Ukraine. And um... Okay, good. Well, let's uh, turn to our audience. And then, Ashley, if you have some uh, virtually deployed questions, I'll take those as well. Uh, 
from our audience? Yes, Ambassador Polk. Is there a mic by any chance? Yeah. <laughs> um, Peter, thank you very much for, for this uh, very uh, enlightening sort of summary of uh, where we find ourselves and how we respond to the question of broadening the concept of deterrence. One of the things that I have always argued about in terms of U.S. national uh, security interests and foreign policy is uh, that difference between um, what keeps us up at night and what uh, what you heard our former defense secretary say about keeping other people up at night, that mm -hmm. it's much more important to keep other people wondering what we're going to do, which Ronald Reagan was so effective at. And I'd like to read you a quote from George Kennan, because you mentioned containment before, yeah. and ask you, what you whether you agree with this or not. And that is, he talked about uh, uh, creating among the peoples of the world generally the impression of a country, talking about the U.S., which knows what it wants, which is coping successfully with the problem of its internal life and with the responsibilities of a world power, and which has a spiritual vitality capable of holding its own amongst the major ideological currents of the time. Given that when he said this, and given who he is the architect of, uh, what he's the, the, the architect of. Do you think America is that country that he describes here right now, as you look at us today? Um, I, I don't know <laughs> the answer. Because, I mean, you can make an argument. I mean, look at this House bill that just passed. I mean, yeah, obviously it was an hour wrong thing. Speaker Johnson, who was sort of a Division C politician, actually pulled off you know, kind of this fairly spectacular political move. I think that was surprising to our rivals. Uh, you know, we're about to come probably the most contentious political election and, you know, for a long time. But I'm also reminded of the fact that Senator Sumner was almost beaten to death on the floor of the House in 1857 by a segregationist uh, member of the House. So, I mean, it's not political violence is just part of the American story. There was a, much, a lot of political violence in the United States and people tend to forget the Puerto Rican nationalists blew up 85 bombs or multiple hijackings, whether underground, the Black Panthers, think about the 68 Democratic Convention in Chicago. By the way, again, it will be held in Chicago this year. And I think it could be, it will be, uh, I don't think Governor Abbott's gonna stop the flow of migrants from the border going to Chicago during the convention. So that's all by way of saying, I think you know, political violence is part of the American story. It was born in a revolution and a civil war. That's just, so, you know, the idea that it's always been Kumbaya, I think, you know, that was a very, very particular moment when the Cold War really, pretty, you know, kind of brought us all together in a sense. And there was a great deal of agreement about who the common enemy is. That agreement has, dis you know, faded. But I, you know, betting on against America has usually turned out to be not particularly good bet in general. Thank you very much. I have a virtual question from Omar Davidson, which intrigues me. Would never would have thought of this question. Mm -hmm. Do you think a kingdom would be a suitable government for Iraq, since Iran is trying to take over that country, which in some ways it has already to count and to do so, create a kingdom in order to counter the Iranian infiltration? Well, you know, Iraq, of course, was a monarchy um, at one point. Um, supported by the British. Uh, you know, I don't think there is any big demand signal for monarchy in Iraq right now. This gets to some of your, your earlier question, Ambassador Sheffer, which is that there is a very kind of important moment in Iraq right now. Al Sudani, the prime minister of Iraq, was here on April 15th. He met with Biden. Uh, they're discussing whether or not U.S. troops should remain in Iraq. Well, the last time Vice President Biden at the time negotiated withdrawal of the Iraq, uh, US troops from Iraq, three years later, ISIS was marching on Baghdad. So that very few Iraqis want to live through the ISIS experience again. On the other hand, the Iranian controlled political parties and much of the Iraqi military is influenced by Iran. They want the United States out. I think Sudan is going to come up with a kind of face saving. They're going to create a commission to discuss this for a very long time. <laughs> and they're not going to come to an agreement. <laughs> And American troops will remain in Iraq because actually it's in the interests of Iraqis. And it, it does go back to this kind of question of with a, you know, with the 
uh, not the acquiescence of the Iraqi, you know, uh, flawed democracy, but you know, we're there because they want us to be there. <laughs> And it's in their interest for us to be there. And I think it's in our interest to be there as well. Um, so um, those kind of, I mean, and they're not fighting a combat mission, obviously. They're just there to provide advice and support to the Iraqi army. So I think that's a pretty good model in general uh, for, our, for our influence in the world. From the audience? Yes, right here. Hi, good afternoon. Um, I'm sure you've seen over the news the last few months, um, the United States revealed that Russia launched the Sputnik S, a nuclear weapon, into low Earth orbit. Uh, from Russia's point of view, do you see this as a level of deterrence or do you see it as a desperate move from a desperate man? I don't know. I, I, I just don't know. Um, you know. The question of nuclear weapons in space is very worrisome. Um, the Chinese blew up uh, one of their own satellites to kind of as a demonstration project in 2007 and created, you know, just vast amounts of space debris. And so, you know, you don't want a situation where space is no longer, I mean, think about, there's nothing that anybody in this room is going to do today that isn't influenced by what happens in space every second. And if like, so the Russians, you know, if they I, I, I don't think it was very clear what this rod nuclear, is it a, new, a device uh, powered by nuclear fuel? Is it a, is it a weapon that the, the Russians can deploy from space as nuclear? I, it's not, I think it was a little unclear. But the fact is, is uh, you know, we're highly dependent on space. So are the Russians. <laughs> uh, there's not a single activity that we do, whether it's going to the bank or you know, using GPS or whatever that isn't dependent on space. So, you know, obviously, if something goes really wrong in space, that's a problem for all of us. And one thing the U.S. members, General Fico, would, would have the answer to this. But, I mean, the U.S. military has to start planning for the ability to fight without the GPS and without, because people have lost the ability to read maps. Uh, and, the, you know, the first thing that's going to happen if we have a conflict with China is they're going to blind us or try and blind us in space and vice versa, I presume. Um, so. Back to the basics. Yeah. Um, yes. Right here. Megan, as I recall, right? Yes, yeah. Hi. Uh, so uh, the U.S. Armed Forces in general has 20 plus years of combat experience. Russia is getting combat experience the hard way. Uh, China and Iran have not been engaged in large-scale combat operations with their core armed forces, Iran working through proxies, and then China has a very Im visually impressive military, but hasn't been involved in these large-scale operations. So what are, what are your thoughts on the role of combat experience on how, our, how America's rivals are, um, how they're making decisions that may bring us in. Well, I think it's a very good point. The last time the Chinese were involved in a major war was in 1953 in Korea. They had a minor incursion into Vietnam in 1979, lasted about a month. So they haven't had any experience of ground war. Uh, presumably, they are aware of that fact. <clears throat> and, you know, uh, the Iranians fought a you know, very long war with the Iraqis in the 80s, almost a decade. So, I mean, that must feed into that calculus. They must be concerned the United States is really, you know, has a great deal of combat experience were it to come to combat. Uh, of course, Taiwan would be largely a naval uh, war. Um, the United States hasn't engaged in a large scale naval war for quite some period of time. Maybe the Battle of Midway, I don't know. I'm not, not a naval historian. Uh, but I think it must weigh on, it surely must weigh, they must be dimly aware, more than dimly aware, that they do not have combat experience. I've got one, oh, General Freakley, yes. Well, uh, this tugs at your, your historian roots. Uh, the, yeah. the international situation right now reminds, this is an anonymous person virtually. The international situation right now reminds me of the 1970s. America had just lost a major war. There was political chaos at home and our enemies are expanding. The US finally changed course once it hit rock bottom with the Iran hostage crisis and the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. Do you think we need a similar moment today 
And if so, what might that moment be? Well, Ben Freakley can correct me on all this, but I mean, one thing the US military did is completely retooled. So the Abrams tank, the Patriot missile, I mean, there were a bunch of things that happened coming out of that sort of, you think about the West Point generation who joined in 72, 73, at the end of the, the Vietnam War, the Stan McChrystal, David Petraeus, and Freakley maybe, <laughs> uh, you know, there was a, a bunch of, you know, future military leaders who even though the war was lost and it was very unpopular to be part of the military, who were joining up at that time. And then the, the army, the military really reformed itself. And that's basically, you know, look at the first Gulf War, you know, basically Saddam Hussein produced the perfect uh, kind of arrival for the military that the United States had developed. So I mean, obviously there are a bunch of things the United States can do to improve its military posture, presumably, yeah, using quantum computing, AI, various other things, then that I think the Biden administration, to its credit, understands that there's, there's a competition for these particular kinds of technologies and is doing its level best to prevent China getting them and or, and also onshoring them uh, so they're here in the United States and not in Taiwan. So uh, my guess is, you know, I'm always struck by something, which is there's no illegal immigration to China. <laughs> <laughs> just, there just doesn't seem to be a huge demand to move to China, and so, and uh, you know if you you know when I look at the immigration debate in this country, you know we can become like Japan, which is an aging population with no immigration. Um, basically, that would be you know you have stagnation from 1990 to today in Japan as a result of no immigration and an aging population and negative interest interest rates, or you can be more like how the United States generally is, which is attracting the best and the brightest. And obviously we have to get immigration. There has to be sensible immigration. Uh, but yeah, you know, I think um, we will we will keep reinventing ourselves because that's just the nature of the beast. I can't think of a single major technological innovation in the last century that wasn't that didn't emerge from the United States. Uh, I am racking my brain to think of one. Um, and none of them have leaped to mind. So American innovation is you know, kind of our secret source. No, I, I do. I, I would just say I don't want to have us go until one a.m. But um, <laughs> uh, Ben, frankly, with uh, so I would just say, to Peter's point, in 1982, it wasn't just new technology; it was a complete study of Vietnam and then a retooling. To Peter's point, but it also was very heavily changed in doctrine, training to the doctrine, equipping to the doctrine. And then being prepared to his point about to have peace, prepare for war. My, my question is, you opened your comments about deterrence is really about strategy and a capacity and the uh, ability to demonstrate to your adversaries that you have the resolve to execute that strategy, use that capacity and prevail. But yeah. what we see is um, we see that our Air Force is one fifth of what it once was. Our Navy is very small. Our army is rapidly approaching the numbers that we had at the start of the Second World War. And we see um, this struggle with manning the all-volunteer force. How do those signals send a willingness to deter if your capacity is declining? What are your thoughts about that? You know, I mean, I, I'm going to defer to you, General. My... You know, the, there's kind of a discussion about like you know the Chinese have all these ships and we have relatively few. Well, but you know we have 11 aircraft carriers and they have like three and a half. So um, it's not just about numbers, obviously. Although, but you know if you're, uh, you know, it depends on the kinds of, yeah, you know, the kinds of weaponry we have. So I I don't know if just looking at the numbers is enough to say well you know somehow we're declining. Well, I, I know I combine it with um, what is our strategy, yeah. global strategy, not small strategies in small places, but what is our big strategy along the lines of containment? And then what resources are we putting behind that? There, you, you gave some very good inferences like our, the CHIPS Act and getting ourselves rebalanced, but it's just not a sense that we have a national strategy and a national capacity to demonstrate, as we did in 82, with 
the retooling of the military and our capacity and our strategies. It just doesn't line up right now. It'll be something interesting to watch, I believe. It, it's a concern to a degree. Yeah, absolutely. And with that, I think we can close. Thank you so much, Peter, for uh, joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.